Thank you for that. Thank you for that support. I probably will need it. I hope you enjoyed lunch and, um, uh, you know, delivering any presentation after lunch is always a very challenging issue, especially when you have to deal with um, a topic which is a bit more difficult to digest, like fertility preservation. In any case, I would like to thank you. I'm, you know, I'm happy to uh, fill in uh, for the colleague who couldn't make it. I'm a, a, by no means an expert in fertility preservation. Of course, it has been part of my training and I have assisted a, a couple of times in cases. Uh, but uh, you know, during the next uh, 25 minutes, uh, we're going just to be discussing about some interesting studies that were selected by the experts and were presented and we're just going to have an understanding of the options that we have there when we have to cancel patients and especially uh, like even you know young uh, children on how they can preserve their fertility uh, with that in mind i would like to start and uh, make uh, or describe uh, the outline of this presentation it's going to include four papers uh, the first uh, is um, the description of uh, and it's just actually the description of the experience uh, from uh, the Fertile Protect uh, uh, network, which is a German network that started, I think, 10 years, almost 10 years ago. And initially it involved only university hospitals. Now it has expanded and um, uh, it takes care of uh, children or um, uh, cancer patients in need for fertility preservation in uh, many German-speaking countries like Austria, like Switzerland, and they have expanded beyond academic centers. And what they uh, did is that they reviewed their uh, cases and looked uh, in specific predictors of success or not, trying to stimulate a bit the discussion on whether we should aim at centralized uh, banking and centralized procedures or each hospital, each reproductive, unit, reproductive medicine unit can have um, a program of its own. The second slide, uh, the second presentation will be about a very interesting study in which in vitro uh, the, these researchers tried to test the hypothesis on whether administering GnRH agonist and downregulating the uh, ovary would offer some protection against cytotoxic and more specifically gonadotoxic uh, uh, chemotherapy. So we know that there is a discrepancy and there is uh, conflicting evidence out there regarding on whether GnRH agonist administration during and prior to chemotherapy actually protects and is associated with uh, a better outcome. Uh, these researchers wanted to see whether there is actually a pathophysiological basis in, that can be uh, shown, can be demonstrated in vitro for this postulated protective effect. Even though, even clinically, we have not yet decided whether an effect it, it is indeed there. Uh, the third study is, comes from Spain, from Carlos Simon. They have a huge program of in vitro, uh, of uh, vitrification and in vitro maturation of all sites for cancer survivors. So they wanted to see whether they can identify specific cutoffs or specific thresholds with which they can cancel their patients on whether uh, in vitro maturation and uh, subsequent vitrification might be a viable option for them. So that's a, also very interesting clinically for us that might be considering uh, you know, cancelling some of our patients on that option. And the last uh, presentation um, is a nice comparison between cancer patients and uh, matched uh, patients for AIDS and different uh, other variables in terms of uh, how they respond to ovarian stimulation. Whether there's a difference if a patient has had a malignancy or, you know, when you stimulate them as compared to the regular uh, subfertile population. So I would like to start with the first paper. As we said, we know that uh, cryopreservation of ovarian tissue prior to cytotoxic chemotherapy is uh, you know, an option that has been used for quite some time. And quite recently, we have had announcements, and I think even two months ago, there was a first live birth announced from uh, a Belgian group after cryopreservation of ovarian tissue in a 13-year-old girl. Now she's 24 and she's spontaneously conceived and delivered a baby. So it is clinically relevant. And uh, so these authors wanted to see whether using a centralized bank might be beneficial. And because when you have a centralized bank, you have logistical issues like transferring overnight the tissue, whether that actually affected uh, the results, and other issues. For example, if we have an experienced center versus a non-experienced center, does that make a difference in the results? Uh, and this is what they try to explore. So in order to do that, they used 
they reviewed uh, all of the cases that they had in file, and these were just 94 patients. And of course, you know, this just shows uh, the, the rarity of uh, um, you know, this population. Fortunately, it's not as common uh, having um, to do fertility preservation. Unfortunately, though, what should be uh, discussed is the fact that many people and uh, many physicians do not counsel their patients to seek fertility preservation when they need it. So this is actually a huge problem. And so what they did is they reviewed the results. They needed, you know, they applied specific exclusion and exclusion criteria. Unfortunately, uh, 55 of, uh, out of 94 did not fulfill those criteria. So uh, this whole uh, paper um, refers to 39 transplantations uh, that um, uh, happened uh, in eight centers. The success rate that was their primary outcome measure was defined as tissue activity means recurrence or relapse or return of mens menses after one year. And the number of pregnancies and deliveries was also something that they looked at. And uh, of course, experience centers, because you'll see that there's a slide where they make that um, uh, classification, were defined as those that have more, uh, or more than two, three or more uh, transfers uh, performed. So just looking an overview of the results, the first thing, the first figure uh, that um, we should know is that about two-thirds of the patients that got a transplantation actually had their menses uh, within a year. So 64 is, uh, uh, you know, the percent. And uh, here you can see some other interesting details that, you know, you might find uh, informative. Like, for example, that the average amount of cryopreserved tissue was 40 to 50 percent of the total tissue of an ovary, this is what they did, that the amount of free transplanted tissue was 50% uh, of the tissue of one ovary, so a part of that uh, was transplanted. The active tissue uh, one year after, as we said, was 64%, and it was fairly stable regardless of where the, of where the location of um, the retransplantation of uh, the ovarian tissue. And uh, that, that location was like into the ovary, only four cases. Retransplantation into the peritoneum, like for example in the Ophiria fossa, 29 cases. And the retransplantation both in the peritoneum and the ovary, which is something that ma many centers do, try to, in order to increase their chances of um, uh, having a successful retransplantation, they go to different areas, either in the peritoneum or uh, in the ovary. The pregnancies, they also analyzed the pregnancies during this time, and you can see here that overall, almost half of the patients that had menstrual, uh, the return of their menses, achieved the pregnancy, and this is fairly uh, stable, uh, regardless of uh, whether, uh, of where that retransplantation was done. Uh, here, we have no pregnancies, but I should know that there were just you know, just four cases. And as you have probably noticed so far, there are no p-values, there is nothing. The researchers themselves did not intend to improving or disproving a hypothesis, they just wanted to share their experience. So this is just purely descriptive statistics. So, so don't try to find answers in hypothesis, this is just to generate hypothesis probably. Uh, other things that uh, they looked at was whether that overnight transfer, when that had to be done, had an impact on uh, the, you know, the probability of um, um, success of retransplantation. So it occurred to them that actually there was no impact. Um, on the contrary, they support that those that had to do an overnight transplantation uh, did better. And the pregnancies uh, were significantly more, and the deliveries was also significantly more. So, do, do you, does anyone know why this strange finding might be? Do you have any ideas? Temperature. temperature, yes. So it could be that they were in a stable temperature or they were in a perfect incubator or it might be something else that happened during that overnight, um, if I'm reading your words uh, uh, correctly. Anything else? Yeah, it could be some, you know, cryopreservation, or not cryo, because they haven't yet been um, vitrified, but some preservation medium that might have played a role in protecting some of the function. Yeah, that could be a hypothesis. What about if it is just that in the cases that we had the transfer overnight, they went to more experienced centers? So the retransplantation was done by more experienced surgeons and in more experienced centers. 
that would be also another very good explanation and slightly more plausible or believable, say it what you will. Uh, again, you, you cannot, because they haven't done, you know, the numbers are small, they haven't done a multivariate analysis, you cannot really tell. But just by looking at this, someone might have said, wow, that's, that's fascinating, interesting. But if you think about it, the ones that would have an overnight uh, transfer would be the ones that would go to somewhere, you know, to a, a big center, and probably it would, they would be retransplanted under the care of that big center. Okay? So that could be an alternative explanation. I'm not sure what is the correct answer, but that could be something that we might need to discuss. So uh, regarding uh, whether the outcomes were improved in terms of using or uh, the procedure happening in an experience center or not, you can see that there was a difference. Again, we cannot speak about statistical significance. The numbers are too low and they, the authors themselves even do not attempt something of that sort. But the pregnancies in total were uh, in experienced centers, 33%, and in non-experienced centers, 20%. And the deliveries were, again, similarly different. So that might, again, imply that uh, using an experienced center is uh, the best way forward. So based on you know, the description of this data, which is just a small experience of a big fertility preservation network, uh, the authors concluded and this was what was presented, that the success rate was higher in experienced uh, transplantation centers and the overnight transportation of ovarian tissue did not have a negative impact on the transplantation result. Transplantation into the pelvic peritoneum resulted in, higher, in high success rates. And the clinical implications out of this would be that probably we need to consider or we need to consider more closely whether we need to have centralized uh, ovarian tissue storage and to have standardized protocols and not just rely on individual centers for, uh, apart from uh, uh, harvesting uh, the ovarian tissue, also storing and uh, reimplanting the ovarian tissue. The next presentation, also an oral presentation, is um, uh, again very interesting because although it has uh, an in vitro uh, setting, it, is, it has been performed in an in vitro setting, it is clinically applicable and most of you will probably uh, be able to relate with the findings and uh, gain something out of it. So again, there is a big um, discussion on whether using GnRH agonist downregulation during cytotoxic and most specifically gonadotoxic chemotherapy could protect your patients from the ovaries of your patients actually from damage. So there has been conflicting evidence uh, published. Actually the last publication uh, that is available and uh, it became available this year it's in obstetrics and gynecology suggests that there is no evidence that it offers any, any benefit. But I accept the fact that there is an ongoing discussion and there are some uh, scientists and some clinicians or even some medical oncologists that advise uh, long um, generate uh, agonist downregulation. So they, their aim was to take this hypothesis and try to explore it in an in vitro model whether there would be any pathophysiological basis in order to expect a protective effect. For example, to investigate whether it generates acting via its cognate receptors protects against cytotoxic chemotherapy. So in order to do that, they have first, as you can understand, had to construct an in vitro model of the ovary, which is not an easy thing to do. So they used ovarian cortical pieces coming from 15 patients aged 14 to 37. Uh, they also had non-proliferating luteinized granulosa cells and proliferating non-lutinized, of course, granulosa cells included in that co-culture. And they uh, co-cultured uh, this uh, in vitro model, or this, they exposed this in vitro model to different cytotoxic and potentially gonadotoxic uh, chem chem chemotherapeutic agents, like cy cyclophosphamide, cisplatin, paclitaxel, uh, ionizing radiation, and uh, combination regimens, including multiple agents. And they did that with or without GnRH agonist triggering. So this is an important study and it's rather interesting because it, they do not just you know, focus on a specific um, gonadotoxic agent. They look at the different aspects, including radiation. And of course they had a control uh, 
uh, sample as well. So they looked at DNA damage, ovarian follicle reserve, hormone markers, and the expression of anti-apoptotic genes in order to estimate whether anything would change with the addition of the agonist uh, down regulation. So the results, the first result that uh, was presented is that the addition of generic agonist did not seem to attenuate the loss of primordial or preantral follicles uh, due to chemotherapy. So this is a control where no cytotoxic effect, cytotoxic agent was added. And you can see that uh, these are the baseline uh, preandral follicles with the green and primordial with the blue. And then when they, add, when they added cyclophosphamide, there was a reduction. Interestingly, when they had GnRH agonist included in the same uh, uh, culture, in the same uh, experiment, there was no difference. So adding generous agonists did not uh, actually uh, have an effect. The same for cisplatin. Paclitaxel was probably one of those agents that was not specifically or especially toxic to primordial follicles. It seemed to reduce preantral follicles, the ones that are at the verge of gaining FSH sensitivity, but not for primordial follicles. So again, that's something compatible with what we know regarding gonadotoxicity. And radiation, uh, again, was highly gonadotoxic, and adding GnRH agonist did not actually have a protective effect. The uh, observed uh, gonadotoxicity and the pro observed loss in terms of primordial and preantral follicles was comparable. Another, uh, you know, another aspect that they looked at was the AMH concentrations of uh, uh, in these cases. So what they looked at, they saw that similar results. You could see that in all cases. Uh, uh, you would have a significant drop in the AMH production. And Paclitaxel was, again, the one being less gonadotoxic. And adding GnRH agonist did not have an effect on the AMH that would be you know, isolated from uh, that culture. Uh, again, they looked at estradiol, quite a similar picture. Ovarian tissue samples produce significantly less estradiol following chemotherapy, as one would expect, since you have less preantral follicles, since you have a, you know, less of an ovarian activity overall. And uh, estradiol, fol estradiol levels following radiation and generates uh, uh, agonist was significantly reduced from controls, which is an interesting finding, but at the same time, it could just be a type 1 error meaning it could just be there by chance. But it is a finding that the authors noted during their presentation. In regards to the associations observed, uh, between the correlations observed between the follicles and the various uh, parameters, like uh, the follicle count and the AMH, the follicle count and the estradiol, and the AMH and the estradiol, what they saw is that whenever chemotherapy came into play, regardless of whether if you know, GnRH agonist was added or not, it didn't make any difference, the observed correlations were either reduced in strength or not there anymore. Regarding the expression of anti-apoptotic genes, we saw, or they, they saw, and uh, they presented that there were two, uh, uh, actually, there were two anti-apoptotic genes that uh, uh, their expression was further reduced with co-administration of GnRH agonist, and that in most cases, chemotherapy did not increase the expression of anti-apoptotic genes. There were three genes as said, that were significantly reduced following cyclophosphamide pretreatment. But if you look closely, when you add uh, the GnRH agonist, you can see that in two cases, in the MCL1 and the BRC2, there was a significant difference, meaning that the addition of GnRH agonist actually reduced even further the expression of these two antiepiptotic genes. So the conclusions and the clinical implications, cyclophosphamide and cisplatin impacted both preantral and primordial follicles, while paclitaxel was detrimental only to growing follicles. There is the co-administration of GnRH agonist in this in vitro model, and this um, GnRH agonist was uh, eupyrolide acetate, did not appear to offer any benefit in this in vitro model. Again, we have to be really careful when we try to extrapolate data from animal or in vitro models to humans because there might be a completely different mechanism through which in vivo uh, a generated agonist might offer a protective effect. 
But however, having said that, their experiment and their hypothesis was quite straightforward and they failed to find any evidence substantiating a potential protective effect uh, for GnRH agonist administration. The third uh, presentation is an oral presentation and uh, it was based on the concept that in some cancer patients, one option might be actually, and especially those cancer patients in which uh, surgery might not be something that they would like to do straight away and they would like to explore other options. And at the same time, ovarian stimulation and, for example, vitrification of oocytes is not an option, having, for example, hormone-sensitive uh, uh, tumors. Then, in vitro maturation, collection of, uh, um, you know, of uh, COCs, and then uh, hopefully uh, production or uh, waiting for M2s, and then vitrifying those might be another alternative option. However, we are not sure yet how many uh, vitrified M2s we would need in order to get live birth rate, because the data actually is just not there. We know from PCOS women that undergo uh, uh, IVM in vitro maturation that you need around 10 uh, vitrified oocytes in order to have a good chance of having one live birth. So based on that, they wanted to see whether they can actually identify good candidates for this method. And for this reason, they said, we're going to look at the data we have and we're going to look at how many, at, for example, can we use AFC? Antral follicle count or AMH in order to predict which of these patients would be good candidates for this method. So this was a retrospective study. They uh, analyzed more than 300 cycles, cancer patients aged 18 to 40. They were candidates for, uh, as we said, uh, IVM and oocyte vitrification. And it was over a five-year time period. Uh, AFC and AMAs were measured just prior to uh, the actual oocyte retrieval, and logistic regression was used for the analysis. So the majority of patients that uh, contributed into this sample, as one would imagine, were breast cancer patients. There were some from hematological diseases and some other malignancies. Overall, as we said, age was 18 to 40, and um, uh, the AFC, they were 21 plus 2 and plus minus 12, and uh, in terms of the serum AMAs, the mean was around 4.7. That's the overall description of uh, this sample. About half and half uh, uh, were the collections, the IVM collections in the luteal and the follicular phase. Regarding the number of COCs retrieved through uh, during this uh, time, around 10. The number of metaphase two oocytes was around 5.6, and that led to an overall maturation rate of 61.6%, which is actually really good. So now looking at the actual results, they tried to identify whether they could find a proper threshold for patients that would give them uh, either eight, 10, or 15 vitrified oocytes through IVM thinking that probably that would, be, that would allow them to counsel patients appropriately. So regarding the 10, which is what they were primarily aiming at, 21 was the number of, a of AFC that would be required. That was the optimal cutoff. However, even this optimal cutoff was not that great. It has a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 68%. Does anyone know what's the difference between sensitivity and specificity? What does sensitivity mean? Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right, but can you, you know, just describe it differently so that some, a, anyone would understand, everyone would understand? I was just positive, which one is that true positive? Yeah, the true positive. So by true positive, we mean how many of those who actually had, uh, you know, 10 IVM or more, we were able to pick up by using this cutoff. So if you use the 21 cutoff, those that had 21 or more, we were able to predict accurately and correctly 81% of them that would have more than uh, 10. So in 90, 19% of the cases, we did not predict correctly, meaning that they had less than 21 and still got more than 10. What's, uh, what, what's the meaning of specificity? True negative. Can you explain that? What, what does that mean? in terms of like, you know, clinically. Okay, 
True negative means that if we, for example, want to uh, look how many would not meet that criterion, uh, then if we use that uh, cutoff, then we know that 32% 32, uh, 32 of the patients that would be predicted as not making uh, 10 IVM or more, were actually pre it was actually wrong. For 32% of the patients, we predicted that they would not make 10 IVM vitrified oocytes, and uh, actually they did. So this, you know, this is again not a bad threshold, but this gives you an overall understanding of how accurate things can be. So regarding AMH, the level that uh, they thought would best describe or predict uh, uh, the retrieval of, um, and of 10 vitrified, of 10 oocytes uh, cryopreserved or more was 3.8 with a sensitivity of 0 0.87 and a specificity of 0 0.66. Again, not bad, but not particularly good. Most importantly though, having identified these thresholds, the researchers suggested that probably because we need such a high threshold of uh, AFC and we need a substantial concentration of AMH, probably having that in mind, it would be advisable to always consider, apart from IVM and vitrification, also ovarian tissue storage and cryopreservation. Coming to the last, to the last poster slide, uh, this was a nice, interesting study where th these researchers tried to answer whether there is a differential response to the same ovarian stimulation if a patient has cancer or if she's just subfertile. And in order to assess that, they used what we call the follicular output rate, which is the number of or the percentage uh, of um, um, the pre-ovulatory follicles that you have on the day of the trigger. And by pre-ovulatory, I mean 16 to uh, 20 millimeters in mean diameter, divided by the number of AFCs that you had prior to ovarian stimulation. So in order to do that, they analyzed 71 cancer patients uh, aged 22 year, to, to 40 years who were candidates for uh, oocyte vitrification. And that study uh, actually uh, was performed from July 2014 to December 2014. Ovarian stimulation characteristics uh, and outcomes were compared with that of 91 infertile women that constituted the control group and they were matched for age. Uh, FSAFC, serum AMS levels, and F FSA starting doses. So they try to make those two populations comparable, yet as you can imagine, there are many other confounders that might have infiltrated. They looked at the fort, and uh, antral follicles were counted before FSA administration and on the day of the triggering. So regarding the results, the total uh, dose of gonadotrophin was not significantly different. The duration of stimulation was not significantly different. There was a difference in, uh, interestingly, on the, in the estradiol levels on the day of ACG. More specifically, in the fertility preservation group, in the patients that had malignancies, the um, estradiol was, appeared to be uh, lower than in just subfertile patients. Although, as you can see, the number of, um, you know, the duration of stimulation uh, was similar, and at the same time, as you can see here, the number of oocytes retrieved is similar, or someone might even say that it might be slightly higher in the fertility preservation group. So that was an interesting finding. And um, uh, there was no other difference in terms of fort or in terms of metaphase two oocytes obtained. So the conclusions, the cancer status, according to the researchers, may not impact the responsiveness of small antral follicles to exogenous FSAs as assessed by the fort. However, they also postulated that there might be an underlying mechanism by which uh, there are alterations in the granulosa cells and that led to a slightly impaired steroidogenic activity in the cancer patients. Again, this is a hypothesis that was postulated by the researchers. There are not many evidence about this. There are not many studies about this. So it's quite interesting to see whether it will be confirmed in the future and whether we can actually explain that. So to summarize, <clears throat> we looked at one nice study where they described the data from Fertile Protect from Germany, and uh, they concluded that uh, 
tr transplantation in the peritoneum results in, higher, in high success rates, and that might be an alternative to transplantation in the ovary, and at the same time that experienced centers might actually be doing better than non-experienced, and that overnight uh, transfer does not seem to have, at least does not seem to have a detrimental impact. Uh, we looked at a study at and a nice in vitro model to trying to test whether the agonist could uh, cryo could protect uh, uh, the follicles uh, that were exposed to cytotoxic chemotherapy, and that did not appear to be the case. Carlos Simon presented a paper about whether we could identify an optimal threshold for AFC and AMH. Their optimal threshold was not that great, but still it was identified. But most importantly, it was quite high, and that made them actually support that we should also consider, uh, at the same time, uh, ovarian uh, tissue cryobanking. And the last uh, presentation was that the responses between cancer patients and similar patients of similar uh, ovarian reserve but Sapertal appear to be compatible, apart from the estradiol on the day of ACG, and that might be related to um, you know, a postulated altered physiology of the granulosa cells. And with that, I would like to conclude this presentation and thank you for your attention.